Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of the Vitz School of Geosciences GeoTalk. Um, thanks very much to CCIC Group for sponsoring Drinks and Crisps, as usual. And today we have Dr. Rene Boyson jointly at the School of Geosciences in Vitz and the Helmholtz Institute of Freiburg, who is going to talk to us about hyperspectral imaging to map lithium pegmatite. Renee did her MSc and PhD, both in association with Witz and Helmholtz, um, on this topic. However, her MSc was mainly on rare earth element deposits, whereas her PhD covered rare earth elements, tin, and lithium. They have been focusing on multi-scale remote sensing hyperspectral scanning of critical raw material mineral deposits. And recently, Renee was awarded one of six awardees of a UNESCO L'Oreal Women in Science postdoctoral award. So without further ado, very much like you to put your hands together for Dr. Renee Boyson and her talk on hyperspectral scanning, imaging to map lithium bearing pegmatites. Okay, um, thank you for the introduction. That was very nice. Um, hi everybody, I'm Renee, and Paul very exhaustively already introduced my topic, so let's go to the first slide. Uh, with that, I thought what would be interesting is to talk maybe a little bit of the work that we do at the Helmholtz Institute. Uh, it doesn't quite just cover um, mineral exploration, it covers uh, various methods to um, extract um, and source critical raw materials. And this can include things like uh, material sorting and characterization. So here at the top, you see um, in the lab there, you see a physicist sitting there with one of our devices. It's a, a sensor, it's a sensor-based um, material sorting conveyor belt. It has ramen on it, lips, um, hyperspectral imaging sensors, uh, laser profiling sensors, and we use that to improve the sorting of materials and therefore improve recycling. We also like the work that I do. We focus on. That's the Zoom microphone, okay? Okay. I'm gonna make sure it's working. But I don't see it moving. Can everybody hear us? I think they can hear us. I just don't see the banner moving. There we go. There we go. Perfect. Okay. So, as I was saying, um, some of the other work that we do is specifically in mineral exploration. And with this, we focus on non invasive technologies to do mineral exploration. And this also encompasses drone-borne hyperspectral imaging, drone-borne geophysics, like uh, magnetics and radiometrics, ground-based hyperspectral scanning, drill core hyperspectral scanning. And our latest topic is underground mine mapping, where we use um, robots to better map the mine. So there you can see one of the spots, the Boston Dynamics spot um, robots that we have a hyperspectral spectral sensor on to improve uh, underground mine mapping. But okay, so enough of what we do at Helmholtz, uh, part of what we do, um, let's go into my topic, which is the use of hyperspectral imaging for mineral exploration. So practically, why do we use hyperspectral imaging? Well, we can acquire data over inaccessible areas, uh, thus producing large high resolution superficial mineral maps, uh, by taking such a remote sensing approach, we can increase the safety, speed, and efficiency at which the data is being acquired. Um, and to cover what is hyperspectral imaging, because that's not a typical topic in geology, uh, it falls under the umbrella of optical remote sensing. Uh, and to explain a little bit of uh, what happens is, well, when the sun uh, emits its radiation, so a light source, uh, it reflects off of a surface. It either is reflected, like I mentioned, uh, emitted or transmitted. And what we do is then we measure this reflected radiation um, with our sensors. And different materials on Earth have different characteristic uh, spectral uh, features that we can use to identify them with, like a fingerprint. Uh, and then we can also map them. Please keep in mind that this is only superficial, so it's really just the surface of um, a material. 
the data that we acquire ranges from the visible to the long wave infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and here you can see that in more detail. So we acquire data from about 400 nanometers or 0.4 micrometers micrometers, all the way from to the near infrared, short wave infrared, mid wave and long wave, which is sitting around about 20,000 nanometers. Um, something to take into account here. Uh, in the near infrared and short wave infrared, uh, we measure the reflected radiation. However, from your mid wave to long wave, uh, your emittance starts to increase and different protocols are required to capture the data and process the data once you get into the long wave infrared. And so how can we use this information for geology? Well, different types of minerals have different characteristic spectral features in the different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. For example, uh, here I listed some of the typical minerals that we usually see um, and where they are characteristic. So if you look in the linear, for example, we can see um, rare earth elements such as neodymium. Uh, neodymium have these characteristic absorption features around 580, 740, and 800 nanometers. And then when we start looking in the short wave, which I would account for maybe from 1,000 to 2,500 nanometers, um, we, we can start seeing minerals, alteration minerals such as micas and clays, are also mm -hmm. carbonates. So for example, a calcite would have uh, this very sharp absorption feature around 2,300 nanometers. Um, and then in the long wave, we can identify typical rock forming minerals such as falspars and quartz, all of even. Um, and here I show a typical quartz spectrum in the long wave. And this is how we can use spectroscopy to identify different minerals. So moving from spectroscopy to spectral imaging. Uh, this is where we acquire a hyper or multispectral data cube of a scene. So essentially, this is what a hypercube or a multispectral um, data cube would look like. Your X and Y would represent your spatial information that you acquire, so your trees, your water, whatever. And your uh, Z axis would represent your uh, spectral information. Now, as I mentioned, we can acquire it as, either as a hyperspectral or multispectral data cube. And the main difference being that a multispectral data cube consists of uh, about tens of bands that are generally, generally broad and not necessarily contiguous. Uh, this is important. Then when you compare that to a hyperspectral data cube, it consists of hundreds of narrow contiguous bands. Um, and, and as you can see here, if you compare a spectrum that is the exact same between multi and hyperspectral, you can see quite a lot of differences between the two. And so for the work that I do, I, of course, focus on the hyperspectral data. And to get into the actual case study, so to demonstrate the applicability of hyperspectral imaging uh, in the field, we chose the OIS tin mine in Western Namibia. So the OIS tin mine, as the, mine, as the name suggests, is a, a tin mine that they mine the citrite. Um, it is a pegmatite uh, body and it's operated and owned by Aquitan Mining Company. Um, then to go into, to summarize the geology of this, the OIS pegmatites form part of the Cape Cross OIS pegmatite belt, which included granitic and metasedimentary uh, lithologies of the Neoproterozoic Damara belt. The pegmatites are LCT rare element pegmatites, and there are genuine, generally uh, lens-shaped pegmatites trending northeast. Uh, the, the data that we acquired are specifically from their main active pit, the V1, V2 pit. And as I mentioned, uh, the mine is actually mining tin, not lithium. But of course, we focus on the lithium in our study. So the sensor that we use to acquire the hyperspectral data is the Spectrum Asia Phoenix. This is a tripod mounted push broom scanner, which means that um, as the sensor rotates, it acquires one line of pixels at a time. Um, we acquire data from 400 to 2,500 nanometers. So this is the veneer to the swir. And the spectral resolution is 3.5 in the veneer and 10 nanometers in the short wave infrared. The vertical uh, field of view of the sensor is about 30 degrees, while the maximum angle it can scan is about 140 degrees.
So once we have acquired the data, there's a lot of corrections uh, that we need to apply to actually make the data useful. Um, this is very important because without, a, without these steps, uh, we can essentially do nothing with the raw data. Um, and the first thing that is that we need to do is you need to know the topography of the area, the, the relief of the area in order to properly correct your data. For this, um, I acquired or I, I took ground-based photos and in a structure from motion multi-view stereo photogrammetry workflow that I did in uh, Agisoft PhotoScan, created a 3D point cloud and digital outcrop model of the main pit. Uh, once you have this uh, 3D outcrop model, we can use that information to correct the hyperspectral imaging. The way that we do that is that we back project the hyperspectral imaging onto the point cloud. And then with an empirical line correction, we correct it for some spectral corrections. Um, this is by using reference spectra that are taken from panels placed in the field while the data is being acquired. Uh, afterwards, we can do the topographic corrections and the ambient light corrections. Um, by using the topographic information from your 3D model. And at the end, you have the result of a fully georeferenced, spectrally corrected uh, hypercloud. Now, what I mean with a hypercloud is um, you have a two dimensional image where we have now transformed that into a 3D point cloud where each point has an X, Y, Z coordinate plus spectral information. Um, it's a bit much to just go through these processing methods. So I thought I would visually show to you what happens to the data when we correct it. And so first off, this is the 3D model that was created with the photogrammetry workflow. Um, this is the main bit. And as you can see, the white is the pegmatite and the country rock is the chest, the, the dark rock. Um, I think I acquired about maybe 200 photos to create this uh, 3D model. Um, and what is important here is to have the high resolution of the relief so that you can have the different angles of the outcropping rock. This will help to topographically correct your hyperspectral data. And then this is what we get when we do the hyperspectral scanning. We get this 2D image where you have about hundreds of bands for your spectral information. And just without the corrections, you can already see that, for example, in your pegmatite, we can see that there are some spectral differences, uh, which we can uh, account to as having some mineralogical differences within your pegmatite body itself. So then, as I mentioned, we back project it onto the 3D model. Uh, bear in mind that it's not a 2D image anymore. Each pixel is actually a point. Uh, this is quite important because in two-dimensional information, it might seem that two pixels are right next to each other, when in fact, they are more like 10 meters apart. Um, I think this is important for us, especially if you want to know exactly where to sample, as to not go to the wrong place. So you would have a point with the exact coordinates of where it is on the wall. And of course, I mentioned the topography plays a role in the spectral collections. And here you can see the angle, different angles of your outcrop and how we corrected the spectrum according to that. So you can see at the top is the uncorrected spectrum and then the bottom, the corrected spectrum. And to get to the actual results. So first we started with scanning a drill hole, a drill core that was drilled in that main pit to estimate, uh, not to estimate, sorry, to detect the different minerals in the carbonatite itself. So we used hyperspectral scanning again to scan the drill cores in the short wave and in the long wave infrared. And I was able to identify various um, spectra and assign those spectra to specific minerals. Uh, for example, the, the top iron bearing, I just called it general iron bearing mineral, but it's a typical iron bearing alteration mineral, maybe a clay. And then of course, the, the air at the bottom, we have the white mica, so muscovite. And then um, we were able to identify the lithium bearing minerals in the short wave, which is the montebrazite. It's an ambligonite group mineral and the kukite, which is a type of chlorite. Now you can see where I put the little lines, uh, the characteristic absorption features of those uh, minerals. Um, 
very importantly, you can see that the blue spectrum is spectrum that was taken from our data and compared to red spectrum that was um, library spectra from the USGS. And then to go more into detail with the type of minerals, we're also able to identify ammonium bearing minerals through the typical ammonium absorption features around 2000 nanometers. What's interesting about this is this is not something that the mine recorded. Um, as I understand, it's not very easy to identify ammonium with your typical um, analytic methods. So it was nice to be able to identify that in your hyperspectral data. And then when we come to the long wave, uh, like I said, we can identify your rock forming minerals such as quartz and felspars. And the, the good thing here is we, can all, we were able to also distinguish between the different felspars. So what's quite um, you, well, important here is the albite specifically. The um, albite, so the, the pegmatites have albitization and the albitization is um, associated with the cassitrite that the mine is um, currently mining. But we are also able to identify other felspars such as microblind orthoclase. And then I grouped the alkali felspars and the plagioclase together. And then I use those uh, information to actually map the minerals. So here you can see on the left, I mapped cupite in uh, green and your montebrazite in purple. So in these course, we have a lot more cupite, the lithium bearing mineral. And then in the long wave, I mapped the quartz in green and all the other ones you can see your plagioclase albite is uh, orange yellow and your microcline alcoholic alphars is bluish. Now, the reason we did this is because um, we can have, we can see that we have mineral associations. And what I mean with this is if you zoom in, you would notice that everywhere where I mapped quartz is pretty much everywhere where I also mapped the cookite. Now, this doesn't quite make sense when you practically think about it, because how does one pixel have two minerals? But um, when you look at the thin section, something that you might think of as one crystal is actually a lot more minerals. Uh, so there's a lot of alteration that has taken place in these uh, pegmatites. Um, so we were able to make these associations, for example, your cookite is mainly, if not predominantly, associated with the quartz. Um, your, and then you can see there, or remember what I wrote. And so we use this information to then map the lithium bearing minerals directly on the pegmatite itself. Um, here I mapped the cookite in uh, yellow orange and the montebrazite in purple blue. And what I mean with this is we typically associate the depth of these absorption, absorb, absorb, sorry, absorption features with an increased amount of that mineral. So the more pronounced these absorption features are, usually we uh, say you have a, a higher amount of this mineral. So where you see the, the red, you have a high concentration of cookite compared to the yellow. And the same for the Montebrazite. Uh, not only that, but you can go out on a limb and say, well, the cookite is an alteration mineral, so therefore should be associated to the alteration in the pegmatites, perhaps the alkalization, and therefore we could maybe say that there you could, would have a higher probability of finding the tin, which would be important for the mine itself. But of course we need to validate, and with this we took samples in the mine on the wall itself. And we also ran it through the uh, drill core scanner and used uh, the short, uh, with the shortwave infrared. And I was able to identify and map the same minerals that I found in the cores. Um, and then you can also see, for example, sample number six, I would venture to say that you have the highest amount of cookite map there on the surface of the sample. We also then uh, did whole rock geochem, so XRD on all the samples. And the minerals that we identified in the XRD are in fact the minerals that we uh, mapped with the shortwave infrared data. Not only that, but for example, if you look again at sample six, you have the highest amount of cookite in sample six, which correlates with the fact that we have mapped the highest amount of cookite in your hyperspectral data. Uh, we went a little bit further and also did ICP AES to determine the lithium content. And again, it correlated with. Uh, what we found in the XRD and hyperspectral data. 
the samples with the highest amount of phytides also contain the highest amount of lithium. And so what are the next steps? Um, so we went back last year and the idea is to have attached, which we have, which I'm showing here, attached a hyperspectral SWIR sensor on a drone so that we can fly along the pegmatite body and acquire data like that. Um, this allows us to get much closer to the wall itself. So if you're in a situation where you can't get the tripod close to the wall, you can use the drone. Um, and it also um, allows us to be more flexible in the way we acquire the data. So to conclude, um, in order to really use this data, you have to do proper geometric and spectral corrections. Uh, without this, the data is essentially useless. Uh, we were then able to produce geometrically correct and spatially continuous lithium bearing mineral map. Uh, but however, this procedure can of course be adapted to uh, other uh, to map other critical raw materials. And hopefully, the next time we see each other again, I can show you some of the results of the drone-borne shortwave infrared data. And that's it. Thank you.